Welcome to the Conan Shane Veterinary Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. I am going to try something uh, new today. So this is our first ever mailbag episode. I've been wanting to do one of these for a long time. I've just sort of uh, taken a little while and, and cranking out uh, some questions from our audience. I went to the Uncharted uh, community. So if you're not familiar with Uncharted, it is a uh, community and series of conferences, live and virtual, uh, where we do leadership and development uh, training and conversations and things like that. And so uh, it is a super positive place, a uh, super active and engaged place. It makes me just happy to be there. Um, it's uh, a lot of really great vet professionals who enjoy vet medicine. Um, and so anyway, I opened up to them and just said, hey guys, I'm playing around with this idea. Will you give me some questions uh, that you would like for me to answer? And boy, they they responded. And so I have got way more questions than I'm gonna get through today, but I just wanted to jump on and, uh, and take a crack at them. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We wanna help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to Cone of shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. You know, before I get started, I was uh, I was just thinking last night. Uh, I was flying back from Indianapolis, and I went to an event there. It was a wonderful event. And I got to see a lot of a lot of my friends, and I got to meet a lot of new people, and it makes me super happy. Anyway, I'm sitting in the airport in Indianapolis. I'm looking around at the architecture, and it's amazing. And I just had to stop for a second and go, you know, our world is pretty incredible if you stop and look at it was sitting in this building and it was like, it was this open sort of atrium area and there's a food court. Like the ceilings were like 60, 70 feet high and steel and huge glass windows. And outside these machines are landing and taking off into the air and flying and people are everywhere. And there's just people watching and just whatever you wanted to eat. It was all kind of there. And I was like, this is incredible. If you took someone from a hundred years ago and showed them that, they just, they would go canatonic. Uh, it just, it's so much to process. And I think that a lot of times we miss the wonders of the world. And I was just thinking about that. And I wanted to share that today. And and I, and I, I say it today because I've been thinking about what does that, what does that mean? I was just, I was sort of just decided to be in awe about what I was, what I was seeing and what I was doing. And I think we have that opportunity in vet medicine a lot. I, I think that it's really easy to get sucked into just another day at the clinic but I just wanted to, to point out for a second, what we do is amazing. The fact that we use an ultrasound and stick it on a pet's abdomen and we can see what's going on inside their body, that's incredible. Like the fact that we can take x-rays and see their lungs or their limbs or, you know, that's, that's, that's amazing. The fact that we have medications like antibiotics that didn't, that's, that's not a given. That, that's something incredible that we've come up with in medicine. And I, I don't know, it, it's just, it's something that spoke to me. I think a lot of times how we feel about our position it really matters. You know, our thoughts matter and the way we look at what we do, it matters. And so I think, I think that the idea in medicine, um, I think it's good every now and then to look around and say, this is amazing. I love that we get to do this job. And so I just wanted to, that was, it was in my head and in my heart today. I go, man, the world's pretty amazing. And um, just the fact that we have a job where we can put our hands on broken, on broken living animals and make them better. That's incredible. What sorcery is this that we get to do? So anyway, I want to start with that. So let's let's go ahead into, into the mailbag. So <clears throat> I got a question from Jody, and she says, you know, um, I have a question I've, I've struggled to answer for a long time. Uh, she's back to being a solo doctor. How do I fit all the patients in and still have time to work on the practice, right? So right now she has appointments four and a half days and she's full from start to finish and booked out for a month. How do I manage uh, the other time and, and shuttle two kids to five sports, uh, to five different sports with much help from her husband? And here's the question. Do you recommend to just cut back my hours and turn people away? My charts and other doctor stuff uh, other than appointments gets done over lunch and after hours. We've started giving clients colors so that we can start to weed out the bad ones, but I still have over 5,000 clients. Okay, <clears throat> I love this question. I put it first here uh, in the mailbag because it is um, it is the most common question that I'm hearing right now is people go, I'm overwhelmed, Andy. What do I do? And so there's there's two things that I wanna put forward that I think are really, really important as we start to, to answer the question of like, do I just cut back my hours? Uh, it, you, you gotta get your philosophy right or or this, you're never gonna be able to do this, right? And, and and this is, it should it should just be a math problem, but it's not, it's a, it's a moral problem for a lot of us. 
And so I, I think there's two concepts that I need people to understand when, when, they, when they start thinking about, we are so, so busy, right? The first one is, what is your ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to do the most good in the world that you can do during your career, okay? I need you to grab onto that because a lot of people are like, it's to do the most good I can today. It's to do uh, meet all the needs that, that people have who call my clinic today. And I go, no, that is not the goal. And that honestly, in meeting all the needs of people that, that call today is in direct conflict to the real goal, which is to do the most good that you can do over your career. And I, I need vets and, and, and vet techs and, and, and just the whole profession, practice managers, owners, whatever. I need everybody to grab onto that and go, okay, seriously, what is the goal? Because you're going to approach your day very differently if the ultimate goal is to survive today, seeing everyone who wants to be seen, or to stay in this profession for 30 years, not burn out and leave in two and a half years or five years or whatever. And so anyway, the first thing is remember the ultimate goal, right? Remember that you only get to go through this life one time, which means uh, your kids are only going to be seven years old one time. And these are, these are thoughts that I have wrestled with many, many times as someone who has two, two kids and, and stays really busy with work, but your life is what, is what you make it. Um, none of this matters if you end up resentful to your profession. If you look back 20 years from now and say, I hate that I did that. I am still angry that that was my life. Then no amount of good that you do today is worth it. It, it's, it completely doesn't work. And so that's the first thing is know what the goal is. Number two is um, we have to be honest about the idea of capacity. We can only do what we can do, right? And in this, I'm just going to make it really simple for a second. Imagine for a second, we're not talking about vet medicine. Imagine that you run not a vet practice, but a, a factory that makes widgets, okay? And veterinarians are widget makers. And uh, the rest of the staff are widget technicians and widget assistants and widget front desk people, right? But we're all working to make widgets, okay? It's a factory. If you can make 700 widgets in a day sustainably, that's what you can make. And the fact that customers want 1,000 widgets in a day, that does not change the underlying truth that you can only make 700 widgets a day without burning out, without burning up your machines, without pushing your people to the point that they want to quit, without making your spouse resentful, without feeling angry that you're not getting to spend more time with your kids, right? You have a capacity. Your practice has a capacity as it is currently staffed. And here's another idea that blows people's minds that shouldn't. Sometimes your capacity goes down. Sometimes you're shorthanded. Sometimes you had four widget makers and now you have two widget makers. Well, guess what, buddy? Your factory can't make as many widgets as they did when they had four widget makers. Like that, that's obvious. It's common sense. Just think about it for a second. But we really struggle with this. We have got to take a pragmatic view about widget making and own for a second that the demand that customers have for widgets does not change how many widgets we can sustainably create in our widget factories. And so there are things that we can do in our widget factories, right? And say, wow, the demand for widgets is really high. Well, what can we do? Well, number one is you better get organized, right? We better pull our people in and train them so that they can help make widgets, right? There are things that we can do to create efficiencies. So training, strategy, organization, delegation, all those things are good and they can help us make more widgets to a point. We can rest. We cannot burn our people out because if we push our workers to the point that they rebel or they quit or they go work somewhere else, we're not going to be able to keep up our widget production. And so at some point, guys, this is just a math problem. It is, what do we do to get widgets out the door? And it, it re the demand for widgets does not matter when we think about the honest realities of our factory and our capacity. And I think a lot of us, and we do it for a good reason, it's because we desperately want to provide widgets to people. And so we decide that, yes, our factory honestly should be doing 700 widgets a day, but we are just going to push ourselves and our employees to make a thousand. And our machines are burning red and steam is pushing out the top of them and there's bags under people's eyes and they're stressed. And, and we go, we have to keep going. That's not sustainable. Your factory can't do that. 
And so anyway, you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself. This is this is ultimately a math, a math problem. So coming all the way back around the question of, do you recommend just cutting back my hours and turning people away? Given that our writer is um, is is booked a month in advance and is working from the moment that she gets there until the moment she leaves and she's running her kids around, the answer is yes. I do imagine that, right? There's no other answer. You can only make 700 widgets a day. The fact that customer, customers want 1,000 widgets a day, it doesn't change the fact that you can only make 700. And, and creating time to work on your business instead of in your mis- business over the long term, that's going to help you make more widgets. Stopping for a second and getting everybody on the same page and working behind the scenes over the long term, that's, that's the best play right? It's, it's, uh, it's just deciding this is not a daily sprint. This is a career long marathon and adjusting behaviors so that they match that, that goal, that reality. And if you adjust and you say, this is a marathon, then you got to stop. You got to rest. You got to hydrate. You have to make a plan for, for running this course. Where are you going to put yourself and where are you going to lean back and how do you get organized and what's your strategy? All that stuff makes sense. But yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of people are struggling with that and they want someone to give them permission. I'm giving you permission right here, right now. Um, yes, the answer is yes. You, you have to say, I don't have capacity to see these people. And honestly, if you've had vets that leave or texts that leave, you're going to have to reduce your capacity. And when you think about widgets, that's a really obvious thing. But it's really hard when we think about pets. And so anyway... That's that. That's my thing. The an, the answer is it's got to be yes. And and when you do it, you need to set clear expectations. You need to say, this is what we're able to do. We're booking a month out. We're not taking new clients. We are not going to be able to to get you in. And here's where people really get upset. Um, you're going to have to be able to give people recommendations of what they should do, given that you can't take them. And that probably means uh, referring them to another practice and saying, here's three other practices that are that are good practices in our area that you can reach out to and people's heads explode when I say that. But like, I, it, it's what it's what has to happen because you cannot make a thousand widgets by strength of will. You have the capacity and you're at it. And the other thing is, like I said, one last reminder, you only go through this life one time and in, uh, ending up broken, depressed, resentful, that's not okay. Like that that it, that negates the whole effort of all of this. So anyway, that, that, that's it. I hope that helps, Jody. Uh, Whitney says, uh, how do you tell an employee they have resting bitch face or a confused face or one that looks like rage or disbelief? Um, uh, so I love this question. Um, I have had someone talk to me about this, and I will tell you, my advice is do what is kind right? I, I, I'm a big believer in doing what's kind. And that just helps me to have hard conversations. I go, is it kind to not say anything to this person and have them continue to think that people don't like them? And then they have to deal and they're like, why does this person react so negatively to me? And it's like, oh, they think you don't like them because of, of they look at your face. I will tell you guys. So, so I have, I have lectured all over the world and I have had thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people in the audience. And I still, I still look out at the audience and I will pick someone out who looks at me that like they hate me. And I have seen, and I've seen people. I remember one time I, I had this guy in the audience that I knew and, and I respected. I knew exactly who he was. He was, he was a uh, sort of a guru in management in the industry. He was someone I looked up to. He's a, he was a doctor of a, of a massive practice on the West coast. And, and like, I, I knew exactly who he was and I was, I was young and I was starting out and he came to my sessions and I was talking about exam room communication. I was like, man, this guy's been doing exam room communication longer than I've been alive. And here I am up at the front lecturing on, on, on how to do this and what the research says. And, and he looked at me like he hated me. But then he stayed for another session and he looked at me then like he hated me. I'm like, he's hate listening to me. He's that person who's who's like rage watching a Netflix series. Like he's doing that with me. And, my, and at the end of the day, he came up and he said the kindest things, like the nicest things that like coming from someone who knows the stuff. He said the kindest things to me. And I, one, remember feeling so good to have this person I respected saying, you're doing, you're doing a good job. And the stuff that you're sharing is really good and really solid. And it was really valuable. And then two, I never forget the fact that all day long, I thought this guy just, just, he was, he looked angry about what I was saying. 
And that was just his face. It was just his face. And so it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's just recognize this happens. So what do, you, what do you do about it? What is kind? I believe it's kind to say something to somebody because I'm, because I'm helping them, especially if they're on my team. And so I'll tell you what people said to me. So I would, um, I would be up at the front of the, uh, of the room getting ready to do a presentation and I would be stressed, right? Because I'm, it's stressful getting ready to present. And I would be up there and I would, I would be working frantically on my slides at the last minute and trying to get the projector to work and things like that. And I didn't realize that people were coming into the room and I had this just intense, angry face on while I was getting ready. And finally, one of my friends who came into the lecture, he just said to me after it was over, he was like, hey, buddy, just, just so you know, you look really severe when you're focusing on, on the computer. And then, and then you stop, and then you're your normal smiley face. I think that's probably jarring for people because they see this, and then all of a sudden you're super happy, and they're like, I don't know what to believe. And I was like, oh, I, didn't, I had no idea I was doing that. And he was like, yeah, it was just, just something to be aware of. And that was all it was. It didn't take that. He wasn't like, well, I need to come in here and close the door so I can tell you this. Nobody wants to have a resting bitch face and nobody wants to be severe or angry or look confused. I, I would not say something that makes people feel bad. I'm not going to be like, hey, you look like a doofus. What I'm going to say is, hey, just so you know, sometimes when you're thinking about things or when you're, I, I notice you standing and, and sort of processing, you'll have a, a look on your face that, that looks severe. And I like, I like severe. Um, it, 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 looks, um, it looks like you're unhappy. And I know that you're not, but other people who don't know you as well may get that impression. I just, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And that's usually all you have to do is just sort of say, hey, um, I noticed this and, and, and bring it up. But most people, you know, again, it's not a judge of their character. It's not saying that they're being bad. Really, a lot of these things, I, I lean into perception and say, hey, I know you're not intentionally doing this. However, it, it, I noticed that it might look that way to other people. And I just wanted to bring that, bring that to your attention. And so I feel like it's a fairly easy conversation. Say it with love. Say it because you, you want to help the person. And honestly, I, I find those to be easy. Don't make it a big deal. Just mention to them, hey, uh, I just want to bring something to your attention real quick. I just noticed this, blah, 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 blah. And so just, just, just be aware of it. And that's it. And then walk away and smile and then change the subject. Talk about something else. Really low stakes feedback, but just just say it. Say it with a smile on your face. Say it because you care. Say it not because the person's doing something bad or to, don't make them embarrassed. Just say, hey, going forward, uh, just be aware. Just be aware of this. Lily asks, what what do you do to reset when you're spiraling into negativity? I think a lot of us get in this place where we get in these negative heads head spaces. Number one is you got to catch yourself, right? If you can't ide- identify that you're spiraling into negativity, then then you can't get out of it. And so for me. Um, I have, I have flags. I have flags that I have recognized when I'm going into negativity and you need to know what your flags are. Me, imaginary arguments are the key. Like when I find myself arguing with people who don't exist or arguing with someone who does exist about a problem that hasn't actually happened, I I have to, I catch myself now and go, wait a second, what am I doing? This isn't a real problem. If you're having shower arguments, you need to catch yourself. And figure out what, what, uh, what, uh, whatever your, your, your flags are that show that you're drifting that way. If, it's, if you find yourself rolling your eyes, like that may be a flag for you that you're getting into that negative headspace. But if you can't identify that you're sliding that way, then you're never going to be able to do anything about it. So you got to catch yourself. Then you need to know what your triggers are, right? For me, tiredness is a big one and hunger is a big one. And so um, if I'm starting to argue with people, I will stop and be like, hey, what's going on here? Am I, am I upset about something else. And often that's it. Some, oftentimes there's stress in my life and I am taking that stress and turning into negativity about other things. I think it's a really common, a common mental game that we play. Oftentimes I'm just tired. I, I need to, I need to get better sleep. I need to go to bed earlier. I, I need to, you know, just, just know that I'm tired and, uh, and adjust my behavior based on the fact that, Hey, I know I'm grumpy, so I'm going to go extra hard today, trying not to let that show to other people. And then sometimes it's just, I need some calories. I need some snacks. The last part of it is remember that your brain is made to have ideas, right? That's what it's made for. And so don't try to stop it. I see a lot of people saying, I need to stop having negative thoughts. I need to stop having negative thoughts. I need to stop having negative thoughts. And it never happens. You don't need to stop having negative thoughts. You need to redirect your thought generating machine down a different path. Because the battle to stop having these thoughts is, is almost impossible to win. In, in my opinion, everyone's, everyone's brain is different. So maybe it's not true for other people. But for me, it's 100% redirection is my friend. It's not trying to not be negative. It's just flipping over and, and trying to find things to engage my mind 
that are positive. So big questions I always ask people, right? If you're wrestling with negativity, what are you looking forward to? And everybody should have something you're looking forward to. And it, and it could be a, it could be a holiday vacation. It could be family coming to visit. It could be something minor like this weekend. I'm playing board games with my friends, or um, I've got um, I've got a craft project that I'm halfway done, and I'm going to finish it up. And I'm I'm looking forward to it. It's just a big thing, just a minor thing. And so when you catch yourself in negativity, going, "What are my positives? What am I looking forward to?" I'm going to intentionally think about those things. What are your escapist hobbies? I, I really love the idea of escapist hobbies, which are just like, what, what book are you reading? Let's, let's do a summary in our mind. Let's review. And I'm just trying to create something that my mind will grab onto and focus on and do. That's a positive thing. Because again, I can't stop it. I just need to direct it over into something good. The last thing is, is that the best, the best thoughts for getting my head out of a negative space are thoughts that are combined with actions right? This is focusing on being present in an activity. This is, this is the essence of Zen. Um, oftentimes, if I'm in the clinic and I'm just having a bad day, the best thing that I can do is pick up the chart for the next pet I'm going to see and really read it, like really read it and review it and say, I'm going to crush this appointment. And then when I go in there, I'm going to focus on this person and I'm going to give them my full attention. And oftentimes that's enough because here I am, I'm talking to this person, I'm putting my hands on my pets, I'm thinking about what I'm doing and, and the negativity slips away. Where we get in trouble is when we hold on to what we were hanging on before and we go in the exam room and we ruminate. We're not really present because we're still angry about this other thing. And again, this is a discipline. It takes time. It takes effort to sort of build these skills and these muscles. But I, for me, the game changer has been switching away from negative thoughts to different thoughts, especially things that I'm doing and just being like, you know what, I am mega present right here in the moment. And so Lily, I, I, hope, that that's, I hope that that's valuable. Jen asks, what are the top five skills you look for an employee? Um, yeah, I'll give you my five. Uh, number one is self-awareness. I think self-awareness is the most underrated uh, soft skill that there possibly is. I think Self-awareness is the most underrated leadership skill that there is. If people are not self-aware, meaning they don't recognize that they make people uncomfortable or that they are dominating conversations or that they are um, rolling their eyes or they don't recognize that they're being negative or that what they're saying comes off as critical or that they hurt people's feelings, even though they never meant to hurt people's feelings. If they can't recognize that and see themselves and go, you know what, I can be better. Or I, I, I recognize that that's not my intention, but it's being perceived that way. Um, I can't, I can't grow them. I can't train them. The difference in, in someone who can thrive and grow and who for whom the sky is the limit often is, is self-awareness. The people I see who are most likely to get stuck in a rut and not be able to get out of or people can't see themselves. They, they can't, they can't own their own mistakes. They look at other people and say, well, these people are just stupid. And I go, oh, you, you clearly have a lack of self-awareness of your role in the situation right now. And it's just self-awareness ties into ownership of, of, of challenges. And if you take ownership of challenges, you have a better chance of, of being able to work through them. So number one for me is self-awareness. Number two is the ability to own a mistake. And those things are, are, are interrelated, but there's a lot of people can't own mistakes. They, they immediately look to push the blame to somebody else. Number three is a positive attitude. Our, our job is hard. Our profession is hard. I like people who believe that the sun will come out tomorrow or that things can be good or that our work matters and that we're doing good in the world. Like, I, I love that. Number four is a, a desire to take initiative based on previous training, right? And this is especially true with support staff. These are, these are, this separates the good technicians, goodish technicians from the amazing technicians. It really is the ability. I, I think this is maybe for techs, this, this may be the number one skill for me, is um, the ability to anticipate what's coming uh, based on previous training. They know what we do and they know how we do it and they move independently. And it is a thing of beauty, a doctor and, an, and a technician working hand in glove like that is incredible. But it's a lot of people, they, they, it's a confidence thing or sometimes it, it is it is the training or the doctors holding them back. And these people have been trained to not uh, exercise initiative. But um, but to me, that's a huge one. I, I want my support staff to work independently, to understand what we do and, ha and how we do it and why we do it that way. And if they do that, then they can go ahead and they can work ahead of me and things just happen. And they enjoy their job more because they are, they are making decisions. They are processing. They're not standing and waiting to be told, go get me this and go get me that. It reminds me of like when I was a kid and I would help my dad with a car and he would just be like, go get this, go get that. 
hold this for me. Hold the flashlight. You're not holding the flashlight in the right place. I was like, that wasn't fun. It wasn't fun for anybody. Uh, I, 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 I see those parallels in practice sometimes. And the last part, <clears throat> number five for me, is commitment to the team. Um, can you get on board with the fact that we're a team and that we take care of each other and we look out for each other and we're all in this together? And so those are my five things. Self-awareness, the ability to own a mistake, a positive attitude, the desire to take initiative based on previous training, and then a commitment to, to we. So those, those, are, those are my soft skills. You know, obviously there's basic stuff like communication and things like that. It's hard to just pick five. I, I'm pulling out the ones that I think really, really make a difference. And they're also kind of hard to see, but you, you can see them. So I guess that's the next question that would obviously come is, is like, how do you find these skills with people? I'm a huge, huge believer in experiential interviewing, right? Tell me about a time that you learned something about yourself. I love that as an interview question. Tell me about a time that you made a mistake and what did you do about it? And if they're like, I, I don't know, or they come up with some dinky, stupid thing, I go, okay, this, not impressed. You know what I mean? But you have to ace every question. But if someone says, well, I'll tell you about the time I made a mistake, here was something that I did that was a problem and, 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 and I had to fix it. I go, aha, that's self-awareness and it's the ability to own this mistake. I love it. Um, tell me about your favorite thing about the job. What do you look forward to when you come into the vet clinic? Those are positive attitudes. Tell me, um, tell me about it. Uh, how, do you, how do you like to work? What's your ideal working relationship with a doctor? How, how, do, you ideal, how, do, you, how do you love to work with veterinarians? As I'll ask that. Or um, to the doctors, tell me about how you work with, your, with, the, with the support staff. What does the dream support staff look like to you as far as how you work with them? And I'm trying to get them to tell me like, no, this is how we do. And this is my expectations. And this, I like to be, I like to be free and I like to know what's coming and I like to be trained. And I'm just kind of looking for all those sorts of things. And the commitment to a team is tell me about a time you felt really, um, like you were really part of something that mattered. And if they're like, I, I, I don't know. And they, you know, and they stretch for it. I go, okay. Um, if they say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've been a part of this and part of that. And I go, oh, this is someone who integrates themselves into the team and what's going on. So anyway, those are the type of questions that I, that I ask, um, to try to get them to tell me stories from their life that illustrate those points to me. Because if you just say, are you committed to the team? They're going to say, yes. And that's not helpful. Haley asks, what are your top five educational opportunities for CSRs, techs, assistants, et cetera? Um, okay. I, I'm a huge fan of training. Um, I'm going to answer this question in a slightly different way. But this is, this is honestly what I really love. I love training that the support staff leads meaning i love training that they make and you know why because they do the legwork of doing the research and putting the program together and coming up with what they're going to teach uh, to to their peers and and the person doing it gets great expertise in this area they often feel like they're getting to use their knowledge in a really positive way that's good for them and then uh, they get to to work with their with their peers and the peers all get it together and so that that's a big deal I, my 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 favorite training is training that one of the CSRs does for the other CSRs or one of the techs does for the other techs and people go well you know, I don't know how you learn cardiocentesis that way. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about actually doing their job and doing the things that matter. And so it, it really, it's about trust. It, it's about, um, man, it's, it's fantastic having the techs put on something uh, for, the, for the whole staff and bringing the CSRs back. The CSRs learn what the techs are up against and having some customer service stuff or things like that and, and, and having the techs in there, the techs see what the CSRs are up against. And so all this stuff helps build the team, uh, helps build trust across the organization, all those sorts of things. I love the uh, training that they do do and discuss together. And so uh, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you handle when clients can't get in for an appointment? I would say there's no right way to handle it. There are some basic tenets that are really, really important. But for the most part, you need to figure out how to respond in a way that matches your clinic culture and who your people are. And the way that one practice might do it might be totally different than another. And it might be because of, of their values. It might be because of the community they serve, of cultural norms, of things like that. It might just be because like you have, one clinic may have just rock stars. Another clinic may have um, very inexperienced front desk people. And they're not able to, they're not gonna approach this question the same way or do it uh, in the same way. They're gonna do it in a much more simple way that's less likely to cause problems. So anyway, it really is about 
how do you guys do this? I my favorite my favorite way to train is to have the people come together and say, guys, we have a problem. Do you this is this is what I want to work on? And say, so think think for me about a time that this went really well. Why did it go really well? Or think about a time that a client did this. What exactly did you say that they received well? And then just have them talk to each other about what they say. And guys, there's um there's so much power in someone that you sit next to every day saying, well, this is how I say it, compared to someone that, that you don't know coming in from the outside and giving a script. I, I really love that. Training that builds doctor trust is number three for me. A lot, of, a lot of support staff will say, you know, I've got this training, but the doctors won't let me do these things. And um, often having training that the doctors come in and do with the staff, that actually gets the doctor to let go a little bit sometimes. If I have doctors that are perfectionists and they, they say, no, this has to be done just right, and that's why I do it myself, sometimes I can get those people to feel good about the fact that they did the staff training and now they're more comfortable to just kind of step back and let go a little bit. And so I think that's really good. Number four, bite-sized training. I love standing huddle training. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't get training done in the vet clinic is because we're all super busy. And we get this idea that training has to be 90 minutes at least, at minimum. And we go, we don't have that. It doesn't have to be. Uh, we can 100% bite-size this. You can do 10 minutes of training, 15 minutes of training. Just, hey, everybody this morning, we're going to come together. We're doing our morning huddle. I just want for five minutes, I just want to go around the room and talk about how we, uh, how we discharge at the end of the day. So when you're in charge of a patient and they're going home, let's just go around real quick. What do you guys do? How do you make discharges really go smoothly? And then they just discuss it. And I go, great. Thanks, everybody. That was really good. I, I, I picked up some things that, that I'm going to do differently. That's, that's fantastic. And guys, that's training. That's all it is. That's training. And if you do it regularly, you make a much bigger impact than if you do that in a three-hour block because they'll retain that five-minute conversation. But if you sit them down for three hours, they'll retain the first five minutes. And after that, it's all just kind of a... a uh, you know, a blur with crossed eyes and things like that. And so anyway, that's, um, that, that's one of the big things. So, um, and number five, um, if you're talking about outsourcing training, things like that, there's, there's a, there's a bunch of people out there doing it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a strong, strong preference. Uh, I think, uh, just in no particular order on the floor at Dove, Vetfolio, Vetgirl, AHA, Vetbloom, those are, those are all companies out there that, that have training. It really depends on what exactly you're looking for, um, and, uh, and the style and approach that you like, but those are, those are resources that exist right now. So anyway, those are my five educational opportunities, trainings that, that the people being trained lead, they build for their peers, training that the group does together and discusses, trainings that, that build doctor trust, meaning the doctors do it, or the doctors help the staff build out a training thing. So you say, this person's going to lead the training program and a doctor so-and-so, will you help them come up with what this should, in, should cover? And the doctors don't have to do it, but they feel very involved and it helps build that trust between the support staff and the doctor so they work better together. The bite-sized stuff, don't overthink it, man. Five minutes uh, is on the regular basis. It beats three hours every six months. It really does. And then the last thing is you can reach out and outsource and there's a number of different uh, pathways for that. Haley says, do you have a script for an irate client on the phone? Um, the answer is no, I don't. And here's, here's why. Um, number one is we, we never really know what clients are going to be angry about. That's the problem with dealing with angry clients. Um, we, we don't know what they're calling about. And we know from the research that one thing that makes angry clients really mad is if they feel put into a box. If they're like, oh, you're angry about wait time. Let me get out my wait time script. Dear sir or madam, <laughs> we are very sorry for the inconvenience. They don't, they don't, they don't like that. Okay. So, so what do we do? Do we just let them be mad and, and wing it? No, of course not. There are parts of this that we can plan for. And so the part we can plan for is what's generally called facilitation, which is getting angry people to the right person, um, having a plan and a system for how to handle them. We need to have some boundaries for the text or, or, or the CSRs, whoever's answering the phone. Um, I want to prep my people on what their options are. If they cannot make this person happy, what happens? How can they get off on the can they get off the phone? Can they say, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not able to talk to you when you're behaving like this. I'm going to hang up the phone now and hang up the phone. The answer for me is yes. Yes, they can. I don't want my people to feel trapped on the phone. And so some of that is having guidelines about um, when do they refer this to the practice manager? Uh, when do they refer it to the doctor? 
Um, can they hang up the phone? Are they allowed to hang up the phone? Do they know they're allowed to hang up the phone? What can they say when someone's being abusive or using profanity? Like, let's come up with the phrase that we, that we use when these things happen. The most powerful training in this is, again, it's, it is very team-based. It's to sit down and say, hey, guys, I want to talk about what happens when really angry people call. What do you say to those guys? Have you ever told someone that you're going to hang up the phone? How do, how do, how do we tell people that they've gone too far and we're not going to talk to them anymore. And sit down with your staff because every staff is going to have different language. We've all dealt with customer service people who have switched to the script and we have known that they switched to the script and it is frustrating. You're like, oh, you just put up, you just put up a shield. You know, um, you have just put me into a box. And so I don't think that what you say is nearly as important as the team says it in their own voice and they feel empowered to say it and they have gotten to think about it outside the heat of the moment okay so that that's my big thing in sort of coming up with irate irate language is just how do you get off the phone how do you escalate and when do you escalate this up to the practice manager um and the, the other part of it is there are general topics that people call about that they're angry about again and again one of my big sayings in practice is um if uh if you're surprised by something again and again at some point it's not a surprise it's your business model which means if you're getting angry clients again and again and again about not being able to get in to see you, right? Let's just say that you're like Jody and you're booked out a month um, and people are angry about it. Stop winging it, right? At that point, I say, okay, guys, let's get together here. This is the problem. This specifically is the problem. How are we going to tell people that we can't get them in? And what are we going to offer to them? And no, we're not going to apologize all the time because I see that. I see that. That's just a side thing. And I see a lot of people who are like, we can't get people in. And I hear my front desk just apologizing all day long. And I go, stop apologizing. It's not your fault you're shorthanded. You didn't ask to be down two vets. You didn't ask to have, you know, the highest caseload you've ever had. And you didn't ask for any of this. And so you can be kind and you can be professional. I mean, you don't have to apologize and grovel all the time. That's not a fun job. Just tell people this is and this is where we are. And these are the options that you have. And this is, yeah, these are your options. And just be kind and then and then be done. So I, I don't have specific uh, generalized irate client um, scripts. And that's for two reasons. Number one, I need to know what specifically are we getting clients upset about? About. And then number two, what is the culture of your client of your clinic, right? What is what is your professional voice? Because it needs to sound authentic, and it needs to be something that your people feel comfortable saying. It has to feel right in their mouths. So uh, anyway, so people say, but Andy, how how do I get that? And I, and I don't mean to plug this, but uh, if this is something that you're looking at and you're like, I, I don't know how to make these things happen or make these conversations happen, I have a course. It's at drandyrourke.com. It's called uh, Charming the Angry Client, and I made it to be watched with groups. And it's for this exact reason. And so I go through and I break down the different pieces of the angry client experience and why people are angry. And then I ask these exact discussion questions so that you can have these conversations with the team. And they're broken up into five to 10 minute modules for the reasons I said earlier, so that you don't, you don't have to close for a half day. You can if you want to, and you just bang out the whole thing in two or three hours with really great discussion and, and be done. But, um, but you can also do you know a half an hour once a week and, and be done in five, six weeks. And it, it'll have a probably even a, a bigger effect. So anyway, that's at drandywork.com. I've got that. I've also got my uh, exam room communication course uh, toolbox. Same thing. It's meant to be watched with groups. How do we say this in our practice? How does this work for us? And it's really me trying to facilitate good conversations in your clinic so that people buy in. And that's also broken up into five minute modules so you can do it in team huddles and, and short stuff like that. So anyway, those are those are some of the things that uh, that I do. I think I'm going to take probably one more here. And um and then I'm going to, I think I'm going to call it there. So anyway, um, Aaron asks, what, what's the uh, best decision-making tool for prioritizing changes in a newly purchased practice? Okay. So you just bought a new practice and uh, you got to figure out like, how am I going to spend my time? You know, what do I need to do first? I'm going to answer this, but I want to answer it in a way where um, it doesn't matter if you're a newly purchased practice. Let's just say you're an overwhelmed practice. Because they, in a lot of ways, they're they're really really similar, and the overwhelmed practices are much more common right now. So how do how do you set priorities, right? For me, I think this is just getting a real simple down at the root of it. Number one, um, it's time to make an actual list of things you need to do. 
And I, I see so many practices out there that are like, I've got a ton of things to do. And I say, have you actually written down all the things you need to do? And they're like, no, they're all in my head. And I say to you, my friend, you are living in a constant state of panic. Like you are continuously mentally going, oh, I can't forget this. And I can't forget that. It's like, it's like Dumbledore's pensive. Like you need to take those things out of your brain and put them down somewhere that you're not going to lose them so that you can then relax and stop worrying about forgetting something. So the first part of all this is run an audit. And this, this takes days, get a piece of paper, get, I, sometimes I use, this is sad, how many, how many, how big my to-do list is, I'll, I'll use one of those giant flip pads, you know, the ones that are like the big post-it notes that stick on the wall. I'll use one of those and, and I'll take three or four days and just keep a running list because keep, you keep remembering things. But then I got to tell you the sense of relief I get when I feel like, yeah, that's a pretty good list. And if I think of anything else, I'll just add it to that. That by itself is a great stress management tool. And then just get it written down. And once it's written down, you can take a look at this thing, right? And so there's there's three questions that I ask to set priorities for a new practice or for a practice of overwhelm. Number one, what is mission critical? What has got to happen? Or we're going to go to business, right? That's that's uh, that's payroll. That's that's uh, that's your DEA license for the facility. Like it, it is it is mission critical stuff. What is mission critical? You need to take that, and that needs to go into the calendar. It needs to go on the calendar and it needs to have a date on it. So again, you can relax. You don't have to figure out, um, you don't have to, to, to meet with your CPA today and you don't need to stress out every single morning going, I can't forget to talk to the CPA. You put it on your calendar for three weeks from now and say on the 1st of December, I am going to have this call. I have already called the accountant and set up an appointment. And at that time we will do that thing. And now it's out of your mind and it's done. So mission critical, what is mission critical? Is it on the calendar? And if not, let's put it on the calendar as a block so you know it's going to get done. And again, this is also lowering your stress. All right, that's number one. What's mission crucial, critical? Number two, which doors are holding the most people back? So in my mind, I look at tasks, right? And think of each task as a closed door, right? The people who are not able to move forward because that task is not done, those people are standing outside the door. And so I look at my tasks and say, okay, these are all doors. What doors have the biggest crowds standing behind them? And if I'm like, man, 10 people, the whole team could move forward and get things done if I open this one door for them, that's a high priority. Like that's the thing that has to go at the top of the list. And so there's there's two pieces of how many people are standing behind the door and how far could someone run if I open that door? Meaning, um, let's just say I have to do one thing And then Kayla will be able to take this project and run with it without supervision for for months. I go, great. Yes, only Kayla is behind that door. But if I opened it, she could just go and go and go. And and that would be it. Guys, a lot of our of our um of our job as leaders is opening doors. We're door openers. Really, when especially when you're overwhelmed, the 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 driving in the moment uh, emotion is I have to get in there with my team and see appointment rooms. I I have to get in there and turn over cases. That's what I have to do. And I get that because that is the screaming, urgent, on fire thing. But the truth is, if you step back and look at your widget factory, and now I'm mixing metaphor, there's doors in the widget factory. Uh, If you step back and look at your widget factory, the smartest, best thing you can do is not jump into that exam room and see it. It's opening doors so that the whole team can flood in and do the things that they need to do. It's getting obstacles out of other people's way. And so if you remove 10 obstacles so that the whole team can move forward in all these different ways, you've done way more good and way more value for your practice, way more value for the pets that you ultimately want to see in your career than you would have if you had jumped into the room. And guys, I see that all the time. It's people going as hard as they can in the exam room and then ultimately feeling crappy about the fact that they're still buried and that people are waiting on them to do things or remove obstacles. And I go, gosh, this is the pain of being a leader. The pain of being a leader is sometimes it's not putting out the fire right in front of you. Let me say that again. The pain of being a leader is sometimes not putting out the fire right in front of you. It is having the discipline to look around and say, I need to go deal with that issue over there. And this fire, I'm going to let this fire burn. And oh, that's so painful. Sometimes you have to let the fires burn, right? So you can step back and do the greater good. And I can't think of a metaphor of what the greater good is. So that you, sometimes you have to let this fire burn 
so that you can go get the plane that you fly over the forest fire and dump the stuff. That's, I think we're stretching really far here. Anyway, you get the idea. All right, so um, what is mission critical? What doors are holding the most people back? And the last part is what can be delegated easily? And that kind of fits into what doors are holding people back. But if you make a list of all the things that you need to do, sometimes you just look and you go, well, I don't need to be the one who does that thing. And I know someone else who could absolutely do that. They have the knowledge to do it. They've done it before. Uh, they have the experience. I'm just going to take this thing off of my list and turn to my friend, my spouse, my employer, the uh, someone that I outsource to, a professional bookkeeper, and just say, hey, I need you to take this thing from my list and just do it and make it go away. And they're like, great, I will take that thing and I will go to work. But you can't hand the thing to them if you don't crystallize the thing if you don't see it if you don't have it broken out where you're um where you're aware so that you can take it and you can hand it someone else guys that's that's it for today i think i'm gonna go ahead and stop there um anyway i hope this is helpful um if you guys enjoyed it you know let me know leave me uh leave me a review wherever you get your podcast i love that if you're uh if you're watching it on uh, on YouTube, you know, hit that like and subscribe button. Guys, if you're in the Uncharted community, I've uh, still got a big list of questions. Uh, let me know what you guys think. I know uh, we got a live audience here now uh, watching through this. Let me know. Uh, I'll probably hang around a little bit afterwards and I'll answer any questions that are there. Uh, if you guys have enjoyed this, um, let me know and we'll do more of them. So anyway, guys, it's been a fun experiment. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm really open to feedback. We can do more of these. We can never, ever do this again. Uh, just just let me know. Let me know uh, wherever you get your podcast. Let me review and, and let me know if you like it. All right, guys, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you later on. Bye.